So this is a talk being given by Chad Lapudra. He is um, one of the distinguished lecturers uh, for CIM this year. And I'm happy to say that I heard his talk uh, here in Saskatoon uh, either early this year, I think, or late last year. And is a very good uh, talk. And we went around the room and decided to nominate Chad for a distinguished lecture. And we're happy to see that it went through. So. Uh, Chad is a Vice President of Geoscience and Materials Testing at SNC Lavalin. He's based uh, out of Calgary and Saskatoon offices. He's got 15 years experience overseeing many geotechnical and geoenvironmental projects and 10 years of non-technical roles in construction, sales, management and finance. And um, his primary interests, professional interests, lie within tailings management, including site investigation, design, dam safety management systems, construction management, containment systems, slope stability assessment, and more. Um, he's a board member and past president of the Canadian Dam Association. He's involved with several committees uh, working to advance guidance for dams and tailing dams, including our own um, NI43-101 uh, work. And, uh, he also teaches many workshops on the various aspects of dam inspection and tailings and management safety systems and things like that. So I'll turn it over to you, Chad, and you can take us through your presentation now. Okay, I, uh, uh, I presume that you're seeing my, my screen. I guess that's the first question that says I'm sharing. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, uh, thank you very much for uh, the introduction and, and for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, this uh, uh, presentation is something that has evolved over uh, a decade. Uh, it started, uh, Karen mentioned that we teach some workshops. Uh, one of the ones that's most often given is on uh, uh, dam inspection principles. And so we travel to various mine sites and, and uh, give a dam inspection workshop to their uh, professionals as well as their operators, given that their operators are the people who are driving around these uh, dams on a regular basis. And, uh, and to kick off that workshop, uh, um, we had a, a introduction that included uh, examples of dam failures from around the world and some statistics of dam failures so that the people who were participating understood that this isn't just some, some uh, you know, regular old training for something that you might experience or hear about once in your lifetime or twice in your lifetime. This is something that's that's happening around the world on a, on a relatively ongoing basis. And, and then it evolved into something that uh, uh, we started delivering on its own. And, uh, and given that it's uh, tailings failure case studies and that these failures uh, continue to occur around the world, there's always new material to incorporate into the, into the workshop. So, so um, just as an outline, and, and again, I'll just ask quickly, uh, make sure that the screen is, or the slides are, are switching okay for you, and I see nodding, nodding heads there. Uh, as an outline, we'll go through some definitions quickly. Um, uh, recent tailings dam uh, failures, so some examples, some statistics of failure uh, that, uh, that exist out there. Uh, very quickly through failure modes, and so when I give this talk normally, it, I, usually I can manage to, to uh, make it an hour and a half, but Karen told me I had 45 minutes, so, so we're going to quickly go through some failure modes without a lot of detailed examples. And then I don't feel it's necessarily appropriate to discuss, uh, you know, tailings dam failures and statistics without suggesting that there are some some strategies that we can implement. So, so very briefly, an introduction to tailings dam safety management systems. And I say if time, but I think it's important to get there. Um, I have also removed the risk management uh, portion out of this. So that's something we can talk about offline if you're, if you're curious. Um, and then just a quick, quick summary. So I'll skip through this slide because it has the same information that Karen just, just gave you. It's who, who I am. And then uh, some quick disclaimers for the presentation. Um, First of all, I'm not trying to sell you anything. So I'm not here trying to sell services of SNC Lavalin. Uh, if anything, I'm trying to sell a concept of, of enhanced tailing safety uh, for, for uh, all operations, all mining operations. 
Um, and then the standard disclaimer that all opinions expressed in the presentation are my own. So despite working with SNC Lavalin as my day job and, and a lot of volunteer work with the Canadian Dam Association, this presentation really is, is something that, that put together and, and any thoughts and, and comments that I might have really are, are my own. So if you have significant criticism or any criticism, feel free to send them directly to me. Um, also, there's publicly available references provided throughout. And the reason for that disclaimer is, is that the SNC Lavalin uh, uh, does work on some of these projects and some of these mine sites. I haven't presented any of that information that's, that's potentially confidential. Uh, the only information that's in the, in the presentation is, is information that you can find yourself. And, and given that Karen is recording it and, and it will be made available, those references are on the, on the slides as we go through. Also, this is not meant as fear mongering. So given the topic of the presentation, um, this uh, really isn't meant to be fear mongering or anti mining in any any way. But I feel that there are valuable lessons that can be learned from from uh, talking about the failures that we have in our industry. And, and then really, I want to advocate for enhanced mining dam safety uh, as a result of those learnings. And then I mentioned already, but this is the sort version of the presentation. And so I, I apologize for some of the content that, that others would have seen if they've seen this presentation. And, and that has been added to, and, and there are a couple of requests for the distinguished, distinguished lecturer talk across Canada. So you may get the opportunity to see some more. Some quick definitions. And again, I'll try to go through this quickly. I'm not exactly sure of our audience entirely. So uh, for many people, this will be old information, but I thought it was worth just quickly to cover, you know, what is a dam? We uh, talk about uh, tailings dam safety. Um, well, I think we all are familiar with the image. That's Hoover Dam uh, located near Las Vegas, uh, probably the most photographed dam in the world. Um, CDA defines a dam as a barrier constructed for the purpose of storing water or water containing any other substance, for instance tailings, uh, should be at least two and a half meters high and have a capacity greater than 30,000 cubic meters. And, and so what, what is 30,000 cubic meters? It's sometimes difficult to, to, to say or to get a sense of what those units are. So I like to say that's a, a CFL football field 12 feet deep. Approximately. So if you're in the field trying to determine if this reservoir looks like it would be big enough or not to be classified as a, as a dam, uh, there is a good reference point for you. I also have in here that Alberta Environment and Parks adds another criteria and there are different criteria that are used around the world. So that's really up to the practitioner to make sure that they're checking with a local regulatory authority and ensuring that, that they have the same definition for a dam. Tailings also called mine dumps, column dumps, slimes, tailings, refuse, process residue, leach residue, slickens, uh, are the materials and liquids left over after the process of separating the valuable fraction from the uneconomic, uneconomic fraction of an ore. So it's what's left over after we take away what we want from the mining ore. And then finally, a mining dam is a retaining structures that exist at mine sites designed to retain solids and or contaminated liquids. So when we talk about tailings dams, and this presentation is generally on the failure, failure statistics of tailings dams, there are a few photos from other uh, types of facilities in here. Uh, this is the type of structure that we're talking about. So it's been built um, specifically for the containment of mine waste. One other definition here is with respect to uh, dike raises. So uh, throughout the talk, the reason I left this one in is throughout the talk, I will uh, mention how a specific facility is either upstream construction, uh, downstream construction, or center line. Um, generally speaking, upstream construction is the most popular in the mining world. Downstream construction is arguably the most safe. Um, it's uh, the most geotechnically stable, but requires approximately a four to one fill ratio compared to upstream. What's more is there's usually a road or a property boundary or a rail line or a pipeline or something on the downstream side of a, of a dam that restricts downstream development. More and more often, we're also seeing center line or modified center line construction. And these quick schematics just uh, represent uh, you know, if I if you hear me talk about upstream construction or downstream, this is what I'm referring to. 
And then finally, design life. Now, this isn't something that I go into uh, at extensive length in the workshop, but I think it's something that everybody uh, should be aware of. This image is from the CDA Mining Dams Bulletin. Um, uh, we've got short-term, medium-term, and long-term life for facilities, and, and the examples I like to use is I've been involved in design of dams that were used to protect construction works, so we're only in place for a couple of years, and I've been uh, involved in the construction of dams where the decommissioning, active decommissioning period for the facilities are, are over 700 years. And so that's not even counting the mine life. Mine life of 100 years, active decommissioning 700 years. So uh, that concept of design life is something that's important for the practitioner. And of course, closure may be the longest component of the mine life cycle. So, and incidentally, our little megaphone man here, anytime I feel that there's a a key point that uh, should be highlighted, I use Megaphone Man to, to highlight that. So you'll see him a few times throughout the presentation. One more thing, and it's uh, again more of a, a philosophical uh, concept, but something that I think is important for all practitioners um, uh, to recognize is, is, is the volume of tailings that we're dealing with. And so I like to put these examples out there where a typical gold mine generally has uh, 5 to 16 grams per ton of, of gold. So for every 5 grams, if we're on the low end of that scale, there's 999,995 grams of tailings that are produced associated with that, that mining operation. Copper is a little bit better. Oil sands in this part of the world, um, 7 to 14 percent bitumen. Um, potash, if, uh, if in, well, I'm sitting in Saskatchewan right now, I don't know where everybody is, but potash generally is in the order of 15 to 25 percent of K2O. Our ore is what generates money and tailings consumes money. So, uh, and of course I have a bit of a biased opinion, but uh, if I could come up with a way to make a 1 percent improvement to tailings management, that's maybe not that significant for a miner. If I could come up with a, a process or debottlenecking project that resulted in a 1% efficiency on, on ore side, on the mining side, well, then they've got budget for me to, to, to do things. The key point there is that mining companies are more accurately described as waste management companies. And potentially a second uh, key point is, is that, that tailings consumes money for mining operations. I like this quote. Uh, many people who are on the call will recognize it. Um, it's for, I'll read it out loud because I think it's important, but for any engineer to judge a dam stable for the long term, simply because it has been apparently stable for a long period of time, is without any other substantiation a potentially catastrophic error in judgment. Well, that's a lot of words. But what is it really saying? Um, I like to use my kids as an example. They don't know that I've got their photos in this workshop. I should probably let them know one of these days, but I took the picture. So, so um, uh, really the concept is that, you know, those small changes over time are difficult to notice, or at least that's the way I like to think about this, this sentence is those small changes over time. If I think back or I look back at photos of my kids when they're younger, I can't remember them when they looked like that. I need those photos to remind me. I, I see them on an ongoing basis and they're changing constantly. So it's a similar uh, type of thing for mining dams, particularly for operators who are on site on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, these facilities, some of them are changing on an ongoing basis, so it's less of a problem, but but uh, it's, I think, a potentially catastrophic error in judgment, as the quote says, to think that, well, uh, they've always been okay, so they always will be okay. It's something that we need constant monitoring for. On to the key parts of the presentation, so tracking failure. Uh, there's several organizations that over the years have attempted or are attempting to compile tailings failure data. Uh, I think one of the key things to note is that these are, are major tailings dam failures. So, so in our practice, uh, I know of others that have occurred which don't make the statistics because they occurred before, uh, you know, the media was paying very close attention or they were of lesser significance. And so they don't make it, in, if they don't make it to the news, generally they don't make it to the statistics. That is, like the media is our, our number one source of this information. Um, a few that are out there, the WISE Uranium Project, and again, the links are here. If you type tailings dam failure into Google, uh, you'll get a page come up right away. And it's usually either the first or second link that's there. 
It's from the Wise Uranium Project. I've got a screenshot coming up. Um, they have a database that they've been collecting for some time. Um, I would say it's not comprehensive. Uh, and what's more is, is they tend to be non-discriminating. So, so any type of uncontrolled release from a mining operation generally makes their, their list, uh, regardless of whether or not it's actually a tailings dam failure. Um, CDA uh, has endeavored to put a database together and that's available on their website. Uh, iCold was the last, uh, or I should say previously the last group to put together a, a comprehensive paper with respect to tailings dam fa uh, failures and I'll cover some of their statistics. And then very recently there was this World Mine Tailings Failures org webpage established and I'll, I'll show a little bit of information from that too, but uh, that's less than a month old, that web page. And, and there, I haven't been through all of the data yet, but they're claiming it's the most comprehensive data set that exists. And of course, many publications, reports, news headlines exist. Uh, Mining Watch Canada in recent years has taken a lot of interest in this. There's a, a lady from, from the US named Lindsay Newland Bowker, and uh, uh, she has published some papers, and uh, I believe is the, the person behind the World Mine Tailings Failures.org webpage. And then our own Shahid Azam. I'm sitting in Regina in our office in Regina today. And uh, from the University of Regina, he did some publishing around 2010-2011 on tailings dam failures. So I know that that's way too small to read, but that's what the, the one paper uh, looks like. So this is this new one. Uh, again, the link is on the bottom. If you're interested in, in looking, you can actually download this database. And then on their, on their webpage, they, they even present a, some of the statistics and some plots that are available uh, there. And what they claim on their page is, is that they've built on that iCold data. So I said, if you type tailings dam failure into Google, you get uh, the wise uranium. Um, database right away. This is from earlier this morning and again I apologize I know it's too small to read on the screen. Um, I think the key thing to take away here is, is that everything that you are seeing on this screen, all of these failures uh, have occurred within the last decade and the ones that we tend to know about, uh, so Brazil, a San Marco failure in Brazil is the top one that's circled there and then Mount Pauly, so our, our Canadian example of a tailings dam failure in Mount Pauly they are just nearing the bottom of this list. And so they tend to be the two that you hear about the most in the media, but, but uh, you can see that there's been many examples since then that have occurred. So you're getting right into some of the specific examples. The most recent one was just on June 4th. So not very long ago uh, in Mexico, there are seven deaths, uh, although they uh, say seven missing, I think only five bodies have been recovered. Uh, from this, so a very sad failure. Um, uh, the tailings ran 26 kilometers along a creek. Uh, there was 250,000 cubic meters of tailings released. And I, I say usually when I give this presentation, just pay attention a little bit to those numbers because uh, you can compare them relative to one another. So about a quarter million cubic meters of tailings and then an additional 190,000 cubic meters of construction material. No information on the root cause is uh, found. Um, I spent a whole bunch of time last night and this morning trying to find some more current information for you for, for this presentation. And uh, the most relevant quote I could find in the media was, many are expecting, these are the two companies who I presume are a joint venture, Manera Rio Tinto, not the giant mining company Rio Tinto that many people are familiar with. This is a different company. And Pan American Goldfields to take full responsibility for what happened. For now, both companies have yet to release a clear statement on the next course of action. And what's more is I couldn't actually even find web pages for either of these two mining companies. So lots of information on, on where they're publicly listed, uh, you know, uh, lots of information on this tailings failure, uh, but uh, very little uh, information about the companies themselves. So, uh, and along with that, no information on the root cause of failure found, although just from this photo, it appears to me that the tailings dam was under construction at the, at the time of failure. Uh, Australia had an event in 2018 also on March 9th. Fortunately, there were no deaths and there was no release to the environment. This was an interior dam, so a slump of an interior upstream constructed dam following two small seismic events, so the largest being 4.3 magnitude. 
There again is limited details to date, but appears to be a liquefaction flow slide of upstream constructed tailings dam, probably triggered by the uh, seismic event. No loss of containment, so they're very fortunate there, and operations resumed, but with tailings placement in the pit. Now I understand that they had to sterilize significant ore resources as a result of, of uh, uh, deciding to choose, pardon me, deciding to place those tailings within the pit. I can't remember the exact number now. Um, going into 2017, this is in Israel. Uh, again, no deaths, they were fortunate. And a quote from media here is, a toxic wastewater surged through a dry riverbed in southern Israel on the weekend, leaving a wake of ecological destruction more than 20 kilometers long. The flood began last Friday when 60 meter high wall of a reservoir at a phosphate facility partially collapsed, letting loose 100,000 cubic meters of highly acidic wastewater into the riverbed. I won't attempt to pronounce a lot of those names, but the, uh, uh, so I gave this presentation early this year and uh, someone from the audience came up and said, while you were talking, I was texting with my dad and it turned out that they were from Israel. And they said that what they had heard was that it was a pipe explosion. And that kind of made me uh, furrow my brow a little bit. And I couldn't help but wonder if maybe it was a piping failure. So I've not read anything that that said that this was a piping failure, but I could see how uh, that potentially caused some confusion. If somebody heard piping failure, maybe they, they would assume that that was a pipe explosion. Um, it looks to me from the photograph in this image, uh, because I do some work at other phosphate facilities, that the dikes may have been constructed at least partly with gypsum, which is a, a common byproduct of the phospho phosphate uh, processing process. <laughs> Okay, China, the next one. So March 12th, 2017, uh, two to three deaths. So not really clear in the media, 200,000 cubic meters of, of tailings released. No photos were available of this, fail, of this failure. And the original news articles appear to have been removed. So to find even this little clip of a, a print story, I had to go into Google cache to, to find it. I had I had seen reference to the failure, so I went looking for information for this workshop, for this presentation, and this was the only thing I could find. So uh, you know, whether this is a legitimate failure or something else that occurred, or whether you know, the media was asked to remove information regarding the failure, I can't, I can't say, but, but it is one that's in the statistics. There was another in China in August of 2016, so you can see I'm working backwards. I am skipping a few, and, and uh, so I won't go through the entire list, but, but uh, another one from China in August of 2016. In this instance, two million cubic meters of fine tailings were released. Um, again, very little information. The image that's on the left, you can see it's from Google Earth, and there is a what looks like a village uh, on the upper part of the photo, and in the right image, uh, that is that same village there. So the river valley was largely filled with, with tailings. Uh, it's my understanding that there were no deaths uh, attributed to this, uh, but again, there's very little information. And then the operations immediately following failure, they estimated that operations would be shut down an estimated three to six months. And maybe that's a good point, part to uh, point to just stop for a second. And when I'm speaking with different mine owners about the consequences of failure, quite often it's with respect to CDA criteria. So, so their regulatory requirements are quite often defined by, by a consequence of failure, which is defined by different uh, organizations, but, but in this part of the world, Canadian Dam Association guidelines are largely used for that. The, uh, uh, when we are looking at consequences of failure, it's, it's on uh, all parts, uh, all parts of that consequence assessment are consequences that are external to the owner. And so, when I say I should stop here for a moment and just say, uh, if there are other mining mining companies or representatives of mining companies on the line, uh, one of the costs that's quite often not considered in your consequence of failure is what are the liabilities to us as an organization. So when you see estimates of your mine being shut down for three to six months, what does that mean to you as a mining company? And then Fundeo. So this is a big one. There's a few slides. Uh, the image on the left was uh, probably the image used the very most in uh, various media. 
for, I guess, obvious reasons, there was enough power from this tailings dam failure to uh, place a car on top of somebody's roof uh, as it went through uh, Bento Rodriguez, a small community downstream of the dam. And, and then two weeks and 400 miles, 600 kilometers away, those tailings actually reached the, the ocean. So a significant environmental impact from, from this failure. Where is it? Um, so it's just north of Rio. Well, I shouldn't say just north. 300 kilometers north of, of Rio is where the mine is located. And uh, some Google images that I pulled up approximately four days after the failure when I was trying to dig up as much information as I could. I got on Google Earth and, <coughs> excuse me, found the mine site. And, uh, and this area that's circled is the dam and the tailings reservoir that, that failed. So there was only one image I could find of the actual dam failure itself. Of course, media is, is interested primarily in downstream consequences, so lots of photos. Uh, but in the early days following the failure, this photograph that's on the right is the only one I could, I could find, which showed that that dam, and maybe I should go back, uh, that dam that's, that's circled is completely obliterated and gone. And I know we've got some, at least one individual from Brazil on the line. Uh, uh, what's more is if you look at that photograph on the on the right, you can see that that reservoir that held tailings is empty. So all of the tailings left that that facility and flowed downstream. Uh, another thing that's notable from this photograph on the right is the is it demonstrates the energy that uh, that came with that failure, given that all the trees have been stripped from that river valley. So this image I, I, I screen grabbed from, there was an expert panel assembled and it was our own Norbert Morgenstern from the University of Alberta who chaired that expert panel. And uh, I, I screen grabbed this image from his presentation on the root causes of failure. And, uh, and where the failure actually occurred was uh, along, right along that yellow line. So you can see from this image, this Google Earth image that um, they had actually set the dam back uh, along this, this alignment. And it's my understanding from that expert panel report that there had been a drainage system that was installed. And I've got some images uh, coming up of, of uh, the sequence of construction. But there had been a, a, a drainage gallery installed near the base of the dam when it was first installed. And you can kind of see from this image that, you know, near to the dam, I'm not sure if you can see my my cursor or not, but near to the dam is lighter color. And there was sand placed near this external dam. There was actually an internal dam also, and all of the reddish, pinkish, fine tailings were actually intended to be installed at the rear half. With this drainage gallery that was installed, the design concept was that this entire sandy area would remain unsaturated and act like one big plug, one big dam uh, for the fine tailings. It's my understanding that they had difficulty with that drainage gallery. They tried to install an additional or supplement drainage gallery, and then they still were experiencing movement and problems. And so they decided to set the crest of the dam back as they were uh, uh, bringing the, the dike higher and higher. And what's more is they had some problems with intrusion of fine tailings into that sand layer. So this slide, also stolen from uh, Nordy's presentation, uh, shows that sequence of construction with that concept of the external and internal dikes and the slimes or fine tailings placed on the, on the upstream side. And then the concept of this big sand plug that was supposed to have been unsaturated. So the third slide, the bottom left slide, shows that in reality what they had was a relatively high phreatic surface. So that's the blue line, so it was saturated. And then they had this intrusion of fine uh, tailings, which causes a phenomenon called extrusion. So you end up changing the stress patterns of, that's not quite the right wording, you change the internal stresses of the soils uh, within this sand layer. And there was a seismic event that preceded the failure. And so it was likely the, the initial trigger for the failure. But um, uh, uh, once it started moving, then a phenomena referred to as static liquefaction occurred. And static liquefaction is when you have a change in stress state that results in movement of pore water 
which res results in the loss of strength of the material. And there was a video on YouTube. I don't have it in this presentation, but there was a video of YouTube. Someone near the dam at the time of failure took a photograph and it looked like a perfectly safe, dry embankment sitting there and all of a sudden the whole thing liquefied and just flowed, flowed away. So uh, very significant failure. Some details. So um, the volume, so we we're talking about a quarter million in the past uh, or some of the earlier examples. Uh, this was estimated at 60 million cubic meters. It occurred on November 5th of 2015 at about 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, there was 19 deaths, unfortunately, attributed to this event. And there was a time, I went looking for an update on this information, but there was a time and a news story where there were up to 21 people facing charges for, for murder in Brazil on this. So that may have been reduced uh, at this time, but I couldn't find anything this morning to, uh, for that. So, so there's my little caveat. That's the largest tailings dam failure in recent history. Uh, that's why I'm spending a little bit of time on it. Um, it did fail after some small earthquakes, as I, as I mentioned. Um, it caused the tailings dam to, to liquefy, and, uh, and that's in accordance with the tailings dam review panel. And incidentally, if I didn't already mention um, Dr. Morgenstern's video where he details the root causes of failure are also available on YouTube. Um, there were other contributing factors, uh, but the expert panel didn't get into that too much, but static liquefaction was that root cause. Um, a couple of other sort of takeaways. Uh, the BHP Built and CEO said publicly that another similar event in their, for their company, so BHP Built and being one of the largest mining companies in the world, if they had another similar event, he went on the record publicly to say that would be a company killer for them. Uh, immediately following the event, they had a 30% loss in market capitalization. So I don't have how many billions of dollars that represented in this presentation, but it was, it was significant. Um, and then to their um, uh, credit, they initiated dam safety reviews for all, sets, all assets across their company. So uh, including facilities that were only in the design stage. And uh, I'm the designer of record for one of their facilities and, uh, and went through this dam safety review process, even though we haven't turned a shovel in the field yet uh, on that project. Um, fines levied by the Brazilian government uh, were assessed at similar values of the BP disaster and they initially around $55 billion US. Um, uh, I understand that, well, in fact, I've got a slide coming up next that there's been some settlement in that, although the, the media that I have read on that settlement doesn't give a lot of detail of, of the dollars. Besides, there was an initial settlement of approximately $7 billion, if I remember correctly, and then the most recent settlement includes setting up a, or establishing a fund to support people who are impacted by the failure. Um, and then the other thing that resulted from this failure was the, uh, I might get the acronym wrong, but International Council of Mining and Metals uh, launched a global tailings practices study. And that was released, I think, at the beginning of last year, 2017. And, uh, and coincidentally, if you were interested in the link for that document, I can send it or I can send you a, a copy of that document. Um, uh, if you read it or you read the Mount Pauli expert panel report, uh, there's a lot of the same recommendations in those two, two documents. Yeah, so this is very recent. So October 3rd, so not very many days ago uh, on uh, mining.com, BHP and Valley reached a final settlement in Brazil over the dam failure. Uh, and again, there's that image that was, that's the media likes to use for, for this failure. Mount Pauli, so something that's uh, near and dear to our hearts here in Western Canada, happened on August 4th, uh, 2014. So we're just over the four year anniversary. Um, these numbers are the, the uh, uh, numbers that are in um, uh, easily accessible online data. The actual values are a little bit different, but 10 million cubic meters of fine tailings released and about four and a half million cubic meters of water. Again, Nordy Morgenstern was, there was actually a three person expert panel. Um, Steve Vick, Nordy Morgenstern and Dirk Van Ziel from UBC uh, formed that expert panel. And it's probably now the most studied tailings dam in Canada, uh, given all of the work that's occurred since. Um, one of the things that isn't commonly known about this uh, failure is that, well, first of all, there was no deaths, that's, that's commonly known, but there was limited environmental impact associated with the failure. They were very fortunate. Um, they had been applying for a uh, application to release water. So water was 
apparently near drinking water quality on the tailings facility. Um, and uh, and uh, they, uh, I think it was Golder Associates that did a three month environmental impact assessment and found there was actually low environmental consequence. In fact, I think they had a larger than normal fish run that year and they uh, made the hypothesis that that's because there was a lot of sediment, lots of food that was stirred up in, in the uh, water systems downstream of the failure. However, operations were shut down for a year. So again, significant impact to the owner and over a hundred million dollars to repair is the last number I, I heard that were borne by the, by the owner. The root cause was an undetected uh, glacial lacustrine layer under a key part of the dike right where it failed. So uh, they, um, uh, and if you've been following the media on this, you'll know that some of the engineers who were involved have been uh, going through um, some hearings with APEG BC on this issue also. So just uh, courtesy of NASA, we've got a quick before and after. So uh, again, I'm not positive if you can see my cursor, but this, uh, the lower uh, retention basin, that's where the failure occurred. And uh, this, it came from the corner of the tailings facility, corner of on the north end there. So there's before, there's the after. A lot of the tailings settled in a, in a plug uh, immediately downstream of the tailings facility causing Polly Lake actually to rise about a meter and a half. That was the outlet for Polly Lake on the south end there. And then tailings continued to flow down Hazeltine Creek which was a sleepy meter and a half wide uh, creek that was stripped to about 50 meters wide during the, during the failure and, and uh, a lot of tailings were deposited in Quinnell, in Quinnell Lake. Um, on Imperial Metals website, I think this is the other thing that I'll note here, is on Imperial Metals website, they've got a really nice video showing rehabilitation of that creek. So drone footage showing the work that they've done to rehabilitate Hazeltine Creek. And I personally, I think they did a, a nice job there doing that. But, you know, despite the fact that there's no deaths, despite the fact that the Hazeltine Creek was reconstructed, despite the fact that the environmental impact assessment determined low residual impact three months after failure, um, if you search for the Mount Pauly failure on Wikipedia, it's referred to as a mine disaster. Now, I'm a little bit of a geek and I follow a whole bunch of these different organizations on Twitter and, and, and on an ongoing uh, almost weekly basis, there are posts regarding Mount Pauly, how there's been no fine still, uh, the, and in every post they refer to it as the Mount Pauly mine disaster for the environment. So, so I think the key takeaway here is, is it doesn't necessarily matter to the public that the environmental impact of the failure was low, that there was, you know, no deaths associated with the failure. Uh, it, it, it's viewed by locals, by environmentalists in the area as a disaster regardless, and they want to see action. Um, I like sharing this slide. So it's a colleague of mine out of BC. He works for a different company. His name's Jack Caldwell. So uh, uh, we actually uh, went back and forth a number of times after the release of the expert panel report and, and uh, he put some papers together and and, uh, and he sent me this image and I asked if I could share it and he had actually uh, said, well, if you clean it up a little bit, that would be nice, but, but uh, I like it the way it is. So I never did clean it up. But when he went through the expert panel report, he created this image and, and on the top left there is that undetected clay layer. So that's, the, that's that root cause of failure for the facility. But as you go through the 1300 pages of the expert panel report, there are another of a, a number of other contributing factors that come up and you know a, a, a bunch of those are listed here. I won't go through them all, but they're listed here. Really the key takeaway from Mount Pauly as well as the other failures that, that while we may highlight one root cause, quite often there's many other contributing factors where you know something different from design. And, and if I've been on my soapbox about anything lately, it's been about, about making sure uh, for every design that we are uh, issuing uh, for facilities where we're engineer of record that we spend a lot of time identifying what uh, the quality qual quantitative performance objectives are the qpos and what's uh, to go along with that a good change management plan so if anything changes with those quantifiable performance objectives what is our 
our, our management plan for change so that they don't become uh, one of our contributing factors if there is a failure to occur in the future. Um, and then just quickly, because I'm trying to keep an eye on the time at the same time, um, some other uh, recent examples. So Brazil had a bad year in 2014. There was another failure that, that occurred that caused three deaths um, at Herculano. Um, I think I've actually got this labeled wrong, the middle photograph. Uh, oh no, I think I've got that corrected now. The Gold King Mine Spill, that was actually a property that was being managed by the US EPA and they, they uh, caused a spill. Not real clear if it was a dam failure necessarily, but an uncontrolled release certainly. And, and again, there's the image that the media likes to, likes to share. And then in Alberta, again, we had one that preceded uh, the Mount Pauly failure and that was at the Obin Mountain Mine and uh, a closed mine site. Um, it resulted in uh, uh, coal residuals that flowed down a creek to the Athabasca River system and then you know, a couple hundred kilometers through the Athabasca River system. And then Hungary in 2010, this is probably when I started giving this presentation, that's why I've included that example. I started giving this presentation as a standalone, was around 2010. Uh, that failure at uh, Kolontar, Hungary, resulted in 10 deaths, 120 to 150 people injured. So highly acidic uh, tails water that, that flowed through a nearby town. So that's where, why there's so many injured. Uh, there was a fine and there's a reference there of $632 million US that was issued to uh, the owner of that site. So, so in addition to the loss of operation, in addition to the cost associated with repair, they, they carried a heavy fine there too. And then probably the worst um, in the world that's occurred is uh, from July 1985. This is a monument, this photograph on the right is a monument that exists in Stava, Italy with 268 deaths. Um, it was a, a cascading failure, so uh, two tailings facilities located in the valley. The upper facility failed, which inundated the lower facility, and it failed, and it flowed downstream to the village of Stava. Um, and then, I know we're running out of time, but I'll quickly talk about black swan. So if you're familiar with this concept of a black swan, uh, uh, my understanding of the, the meaning of the word originated in Europe, um, were as an impossibility. Uh, nobody had ever seen a black swan, uh, so it was something that wasn't believed to exist. So if, if you were referring to a black swan at that time, it was, it was an impossibility. It couldn't happen. And then some people built some big ships and they sailed over to Australia. And what did they find in Australia? But, but black swans. And so the meaning of the word actually changed to an event or an occurrence that deviates beyond what is normally expected of a situation and extremely difficult to predict. For a couple of the failures that I've highlighted, Mount Pauli and, and San Marco, in both instances, the owners came out and said, we never thought this could happen here. And so, uh, you know, is it a black swan, something that deviates beyond what's normally expected? Well, my argument is maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. Maybe it's not a black swan. Maybe. Uh, we should be looking at these statistics, learning from these statistics, and putting better management systems into place so that we're not one of these people standing in front of the media saying, we never thought it could occur. A little philosophical there, but. Um, okay, so some of the statistics I called, I spoke to already, they did a study in 2001 or released a bulletin, I called bulletin. I called inc incidentally is International Council uh, of Large Dams. Um, so CDA is a member of ICOLD as an example. Uh, ICOLD is the parent organization in a way of, of CDA. So in 2001, they released this bulletin 121 and the references at the bottom. Uh, they studied 221 failures that occurred from 1970 to 2001. And they found that annually there's about two to five major dam failures uh, uh, well, every year. So, and at that time, they estimated about 3,500 tailings dams worldwide. We think it's closer to 18,000 now, but at that time, uh, that's what they had estimated. And then, uh, really, if you divide, you know, into the, those numbers, you get an annual rate of failure of about 1 to 700 to 1 to 1750. So, there's a kind of a key point for you that if you're going to roll the dice 
uh, you've got a one in 700 chance approximately that it's your facility any given year. And for any large mining companies in the world, I, I think just an interesting exercise, not that it's entirely accurate, but an interesting exercise to say, well, how many facilities, how many different tailings facilities do we own around the world? What are their age? How many times have we rolled that dice so far? Um, and so that 3,500 dams, I thought I would present this. This is from iCold presentation by China in 2017, where they talked about their tailings facilities. Um, a key note from this slide is about 90% of their tailings ponds are deposited using an upstream method. And then they classify them uh, based on size and height. And uh, they've got five different grades. And if you add them up, they've got over 8,800 tailings facilities in China alone just them themselves. So it puts into perspective the number that iCold was, was looking at and how potentially that data set isn't, isn't complete. Um, some interesting information if you get into the appendices, and I'll try to go through this quickly, but the, uh, looking at causes of failure. Number one cause of failure was slope stability. Uh, number two was earthquakes, so seismic uh, triggers for these failures, so 34 out of the 221. And number three was overtopping. And, and what I like to highlight here is, is that, that for overtopping to occur, and people can argue or debate with me, but for overtopping to occur, generally there's some mismanagement that's happened. So whether it's not planning on the right design uh, storm, uh, whether it's a remotely operated facility where you know instrumentation isn't functioning properly or something, but generally for overtopping to occur, there must have been some type of mismanagement that happened. Uh, also, you know, slightly under half of the facilities that failed were upstream construction, but um, it's important to remember that upstream construction is also the most frequently used for tailings. So it's not necessarily a, 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 a causation that's implied there. Well, and the other thing is, is that there's a number of unknown uh, reasons too. So when I talk about the data set being incomplete, there are a lot of unknowns associated with that data. From uh, uh, Shahid Azam, this is from his paper in 2010. Uh, he starts breaking out the data, uh, looking at the frequency of tailings dam failures per decade. You can see that through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were about 50 events per decade. For the 90s and 2000s, about 20. And then just using that wise uranium link and counting up what started in 2011 and, and, and upwards, and then ignoring a couple that weren't really tailings dam failures. Uh, we're at 22 already without having closed out the decade. So we're at about 20 events per decade right now. Uh, he's got a little bit of a more accurate number, I think, of about 18,401 mine sites around the world. He's estimated that the failure rate for those mine sites has been 1.2%. So approximately one in 100 of the facilities constructed uh, over the last 100 years has failed. And then Bowker and Chambers, so this is this uh, lady from the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and Richard Chambers, I believe his name is, uh, also from the U.S. They put a paper together shortly after Mount Pauly, and this is one of the figures out of that paper. Very similar data, so, you know, around those 50 events per decade through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then, you know, 20 to 30 events per decade through the 90s and 2000s. But they actually went a step further, and they started um, uh, classifying the severity of the failure. And one of the things that they found is, is that there was actually an increase in the, the number of serious and very serious failures. So I would say that the study associated with why that is, is incomplete. But uh, if I was to take a, a, a guess at it, it, it's largely, I think, because the facilities are getting larger and larger with time. Like we are continuing to mine at facilities. We keep finding new uh, areas to mine at mine. Uh, you know, the lifespan has been increased and what's more, ore grades have been diminished. So those slides I showed near the beginning where, where we're chasing those five grams per ton of ore, well, maybe in 10 years we're chasing four grams per ton of ore to get the same uh, uh, nameplate capacity for our mine site. Uh, but in doing so, we're producing more tailings for every gram. This new uh, less than a month old data set has this figure. So it's the same authors, the same authors as uh, like Bowker and Chambers here. I believe they're behind this new data set and they're showing the same thing in there. So for incidents of serious and very serious failures, they're seeing um, uh, actually an increase in that relationship over time. 
Okay, very quickly through the failure modes, and I've skipped uh, all of the examples of each of this because uh, each of these failure modes. But generally, when we talk about failure modes, um, we can talk about physical structural failures, functional fa failures, or and and or environmental failures that occur. So uh, I'm going to skip over functional and environmental entirely and just talk about the physical and structural. Uh, we try to break these down and, and we generally break them down into slope failure, foundation failure, surface erosion, and internal erosion. Now, I won't go through all of the different examples in here. Um, in, in all cases, there's generally contributing factors. That's one of the key messages that I hope to get across in this workshop. Um, and this isn't a, uh, a full list either. This is a partial list. So there's other potential uh, contributors. There's other potential ways that these failure modes can can originate, but generally uh, we can break most of those these failures down to these to these four. So for contributing factors, we go right back to that design life again. There's contributing factors from the design and construction phase, from the operation and maintenance phase, and then there's external and human factors that that come in too. And again, it's it's a partial list. So I'll apologize for going through this portion so quickly. Generally, I like to put examples of each one of the type of physical failures uh, in there, but, uh, but time is restricting us. I will, however, include this slide. Um, a colleague from CDA put this, this image together or this table together, and, and it's potential dike failure and trigger mechanisms. And uh, uh, what's happening at the CDA is we've established a working group to uh, look at slope stability for mining dams and, and provide additional guidance, revise the factor of safety guidance that exists in the, in the uh, dam safety uh, 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 guidelines. And, uh, and there was a workshop in 2017 to support that new factor of safety or geotechnical criteria guidance. And, and this is a slide I took from, from that workshop. And again, I'm not going to go through each of these, but you can see that if you start sitting down and looking at all of the potential triggers for different failure mechanisms, um, there is a pretty long list. And, and the author of this slide also acknowledges that this is not an exist exhaustive list. This is a partial list. Each facility really requires the practitioner to sit down and look at all of the potential um, hazards that exist, how those hazards may result in a trigger and that, again, may result in a failure mechanism. Okay, so I said at the beginning of the talk, I don't believe it's really fair to, to throw out a whole bunch of statistics and examples of failure without uh, also saying what's being done in the industry to, to prevent. Now, uh, I also said that, uh, that uh, these opinions are my own, so again, feel free to call me and debate me on this, but if I want to uh, instruct a, a client on how to prevent their facility from being one of these statistics. My thoughts are really you require a comprehensive or robust dam safety management system which incorporates risk management and best practice. Well, that's a really nice statement, uh, but what does it, what does it mean? Um, this image again from my colleague Jack Caldwell on the bottom. Um, it, it really means that you've got a lot of qualified people working together um, to understand the problems that you've got, the, the environment that you're in, um, and, uh, and building an evolving dam safety management system for a specific site. So there is no magic bullet that you can apply to every site. Um, uh, there are different types of dam management systems out there. Some rely on the observational method, which we don't have time to go into today. Some don't. Some say, I'm going to take the worst possible conditions that could possibly exist, and I'm going to use that for design, and that's going to uh, give me some, some sense of, of uh, confidence uh, against failure for these facilities. We require good guidance from organizations like CIM, like CDA, like Mining Association of Canada, and of course, I'm biased towards our Canadian organizations because I'm actively involved, but, but we've got people from around the world that are also working on new guidance. Um, uh, good regulations and legislation uh, that are there, and I mentioned already qualified people, but that includes the responsible engineer, whether you have an engineer record or you're required to have an engineer record or not. A good uh, external tailings review board uh, or internal tailings review board, pardon me, engaged and qualified staff at the site, committed management, they understand the problem. This is why I'm giving this workshop is to, to uh, uh, 
uh, help get the word out that this is something where we need committed uh, companies and committed staff to, to help prevent and then educated and engaged regulators and and what's more informed stakeholders i don't think there is any value i don't believe there is any value in sweeping this under the rug i think we have to as an industry try to take the lessons that we can from these from these failures and and use those lessons to improve our practice uh, incidentally, an entire course could be spent on that topic on its own, on dam safety management system, not even just a workshop, but an entire course. So they, you know, really the plan, do, check, act system. This is an image from iCold Bulletin. Um, what, again, something I tell my clients is, is if you can use Mining Association of Canada as your guideline for management systems and then the technical information that you need to help support that management system generally is found in the CDA. So that's a, a very overly simplistic way of describing the two organizations but but generally those management systems are, are, are provided by Mining Association of Canada and they have a, a relatively new version of their guide to the management of tailings facility which was released last November and, and CDA uh, a lot of the technical information that you require can be found found there. Um, so I'm kind of repeating the same thing in this slide, but, but uh, these CDA and MAC systems widely used across Canada internationally. Um, I have been involved with CDA for just about a decade now, and I've been very fortunate to be involved in the delivery of workshops on behalf of CDA. And, and one of the things that I, I find is a strong takeaway from that is, is that the guidance that we are preparing in Canada um, it is really being recognized around the world as, as, as valued. And uh, so it, it's nice to see. Um, one thing about these systems is you have to reconcile different, uh, your management system with different primary components. So slope stability management is generally a large part of the management system of, uh, for any tailings dam. Your performance management, your monitoring and surveillance on the sites and risk management. And when I show up to and it may be unfairly say, when I show up for the first time to uh, a mine site that doesn't have an established dam safety management system, sometimes you feel like you're, you're trying to put the cart before the horse. So some of these pieces might exist, um, uh, but many are missing and then they ask you to prepare a, a comprehensive dam safety management system for them. And so as a consultant, it's my job to, to help educate them on, on what those pieces are, what those details are that they're missing and, and how we can pull that all together into something for them that's robust. I'll, I'll skip through this except for to mention that, that this is a pretty good paper if you're looking for something to review. So what does it mean to have best practice? I think Silva did a really good job on that in 2008. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to share this paper or any of the others I've referenced. Um, uh, my view on it is, uh, I've said already, I'm repeating myself, but if you're compliant with both MAC and CDA guidance, you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, there are other recommendations and guidance and, and, and regulation that also needs to be considered, of course, but Silver uh, has a pretty good paper on what it means to have best practice. And this slide is way too small to read, but there's some key things. He talks about best practice um, in terms of the design, construction, and operation of the facility. And there's some of the key pieces that really define what does best practice mean. So full-time uh, supervision by a qualified engineer during construction, for instance, as opposed to part-time supervision, which just brings you to above average, not even to poor, but just to above average. Okay, I'm, out, I'm well over my time, but um, as a summary, tailings dams continue to fail regularly around the world, so resulting in significant consequences, media scrutiny fines, and even criminal charges in some instances. So many potential failure modes exist, but also many contributing factors. So again, one of the key things I hope you take away is, uh, is you know, making sure that those, co those uh, contributing factors aren't something that, that result in a failure at your site. Um, a robust, constantly improving dam management system is required for the life of a structure, so designed through closure. Uh, risk management, which we didn't have time to talk about today, but that's a powerful tool for the owner, not just uh, for communicating to external or internal stakeholders, but even for capital allocation. What are the important things that we really need to be worried about? Our best practice is constantly evolving, so some people like to 
uh, refer to it as leading practice instead of best practice. I don't think we're done defining what best is yet, but we're we're constantly getting better. Um, Tailings Dam engineering is a highly specialized field. You really require qualified persons, not just the consultant, but the regulators, your internal staff, review boards, um, everybody, as part, every stakeholder that's involved really needs to be qualified. And then my closing tip is, is beware of excess overconfidence. So if you hear somebody at your site saying, well, that can't ever happen here, uh, that's something maybe to just take note of and stop and, and wonder, is it because we've thoroughly reviewed all of the potential failure mechanisms and, and we've mitigated all of them, or is it because uh, you know, we're not looking close enough and we just think that because nothing has happened previously that nothing can happen? So I'd like to close with this little quote from Julius Caesar, which is, it's only hubris if I fail, which you know, is, is in comment to that beware of excess overconfidence. All right, thank you very much for your time. And, Hopefully you found something in here interesting or something that you can use in, in your practice. Uh, I have included my contact information, so, so I know that Karen is recording this, but if you want to scribble this down quickly, feel free to reach out to me with any questions or comments or criticism uh, that you wish. And I apologize for taking more than my allotted time, but I seem to make an apology every time I, I give a talk. So. Well, thank you very much, Chad. That was uh, really good. And I think, you know, given I'm watching how many participants have stayed through, even though you've gone a little bit over time and, you know, you pretty much kept everybody here with, aside from a couple folks who uh, had to go off and teach or do something else. So, uh, you know, really great uh, presentation and, you know, lots of valuable knowledge here to share. I, I appreciate you. that you had time to do this for us today. Um, I'm wondering if anybody else has questions, um, feel free to type them into the chat box um, and we can start to, to go through some things. Um, I do see one right away. It says um, uh, P. Kraus. If you want to actually turn your camera on and your mic, you can come right on and ask uh, directly if you like. Well, I see the question there is, uh, uh, do I know any relationship between failures of water dams and tailings dams? And there hasn't been anything recent. There was a study that I used to include uh, the statistics from a, a study that, that uh, it, was, it was older, I think it was from the 70s, that looked at all failures over the last 100 years. And the statistics were similar. It was about 1% again for all dams. So. Uh, um, now that data is probably getting pretty pretty old. Um, I, I think that the management systems for for water like hydroelectric dams have also improved considerably over that time. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the statistics are a little bit different today. Other than that, I would be interested in seeing anything you have on the topic. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, one thing. Uh, well, if anybody's thinking of questions to type in, I'll just note that for the next CIM conference, we are still planning on having another tailings workshop on the Sunday prior to the conference. And we'll be, um, we're still trying to um, decide in particular what the details will be, but I think, you know, we're starting to, to look at, you know, how can we um, educate more people about what are the critical needs to set up, set, set yourself up for success. Um, so probably still fairly high level, um, but to take you through a number of the things like that. Um, and then also the CDA conference is in June, which will likely have some more uh, workshops and talks on the specifics of the design aspects um, in the tailings uh, Dams, uh, as I understand. Yeah, let, me, let me clarify, uh, the, the CDA conference this year is actually next week um, in Quebec City, uh, but uh, CDA is hosting iCold. So iCold travels to a different co uh, country each year and, uh, and it's our, our turn in 2019. So uh, iCold is uh, gonna be in Ottawa in June. And, uh, and there is a tailings uh, management group or working group uh, committee I suppose, within iCold, so they will have talks and papers uh, related to that. Um, uh, tailings and Mine Waste, if you're interested, um, Tailings and Mine Waste Conference is also a good resource. Uh, they just finished their conference in, uh, in Colorado. They go, uh, they skip years 
uh, from U.S. to Canada to U.S. to Canada. So 2019 will be in Vancouver, I understand. In fact, oh yeah, I've got the tailings and mine waste brochure sitting with me actually. So it, yeah. it'll be in Vancouver next year. Uh, and then of course CIM, uh, which uh, I think CIM's in, in Montreal next year, isn't it? Montreal at the um, end of April, beginning of May. So I think it's the 28th of April that it starts. Yeah. There is another question on here from Mark Slater. Um, if, if I, I guess if people are sticking with us, we can answer it. But uh, given that a robust management system is necessary to reduce risk of TSF failures, how as an industry do we overcome a lack of available qualified engineers? And mostly it's on the job training. So this is an excellent question, something that is sort of dear to me. Um, uh, there is no at least that I'm aware of, uh, no degree in tailings engineering that you can go get. So uh, you can have uh, uh, most, I would, I, I would guess most people who are doing tailings engineers likely started their career as either a civil engineer or a mining engineer, maybe hydrogeological engineer. Uh, there's a few in there also, but um, um, we covered very little, uh, particularly as an undergrad on, on tailings. And, and I understand that there are, are components of courses now that, that cover tailings, but you're, you're right on the money when you say, uh, you know, there's not a lot of training that's, that's available. Uh, so most of the training that is available is through workshops, is through organizations like CIM, CDA. Um, the, uh, and this is a problem that's well recognized in the industry. Uh, in fact, if I was to speak personally, I would say, that I recognize this lack of, of uh, senior resource uh, availability about 10 years ago, which is why I started pursuing this uh, subject area as a specialization, because there's a whole bunch of people in their 60s and 70s that are practicing, um, and they are nearing or constantly talking about retirement, and for whatever reason, and I don't fully understand it, there seems to be a large gap in the, in the talent pool and, uh, and I'm either at the young end of that senior gap or at the old end of the, the new generation that seems to be coming through. Um, one thing that I think is important, uh, or one way we're addressing it internally is uh, with the assignment of, of deputy engineers of record. So, so I have a number of, of contracts with different companies where I function as an engineer of record for, for their facility. Um, but we get our intermediate and senior engineers functioning in that, that deputy engineer record role so that they get that ongoing experience over a period of time. And then hopefully they can backfill some of these. And I hope other consulting companies are doing the same. I hope other mining companies are, are also providing training to their people. I think um, one thing I'll make note of is that UBC put out a survey about the interest in developing a specific program around tailings management. Um, so there may be in the future a, a training program at UBC. Uh, yeah, and the University of Alberta. Nobody's paying me for these plugs, by the way. <laughs> the University of Alberta uh, has a course that they offer uh, approximately once a year, too. And it's a 40-hour uh, course that they offer and they uh, the instructors that are involved with that are, are highly qualified and I haven't yeah. gone through it myself each year they've offered it uh, I've wanted to go and uh, uh, just for the sake of even rubbing elbows I suspect I'll still learn lots there but but uh, just to rub elbows with the people who are in the room uh, I would love to go there but it's never worked out for me yet but, yeah. but uh, Great. We have just one final question and then we'll close because I think everybody's um, probably needing to get back to things. But um, uh, Farouk has asked, other than developing guidelines, how is CDA contributing to research and development related to dam and dike safety? Yeah, so it's a good question because it speaks really to who the CDA is. And, uh, and, and that's something I didn't really cover. So Canadian Dam Association is a, is a not-for-profit organization made up of, of um, really anybody can be a member. So, but it's made up primarily of, of owners and consultants, academics and regulators. And then there's some you know, members of the public that have an interest in dams that are also uh, members. 
Um, I think membership is 90 bucks uh, a year, so it's not really a, an industry or an organization that makes a, a ton of money that can be used to, to fund research and development. The way that guidance is prepared in the organization is, is we reach out to our membership for experience and then we put committees together and put all those bright people in the same room and, and they develop uh, guidance by committee. So, uh, of course, saying that, I'm sure most people recognize how slow that can happen sometimes. So, uh, uh, just either this morning or late yesterday, uh, a, a guidance document was circulated to CDA membership for review on the engineer record role. And, and that has probably been four years in development, that guidance document. Um, a little bit of a contentious issue, which is part of the reason it took so long, is what is the role of engineer record. Um, but we've also been working on the new geotechnical criteria for almost as long, probably three years. And we're hopefully nearing completion of that one also. So it doesn't happen as fast as we'd like, but, but uh, uh, that's the way that we're developing guidance at this moment. Yeah, I would say that it's a very similar process with CIM as well. So, um, you know, looking out to see what other groups are doing in terms of research and helping to um, spread the knowledge about that. So, um, anyways. Yeah, it's Corolla. Maybe that's a good topic for our workshop as well as um, the exploring that aspect of it, who's doing research. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, so I think uh, given that we don't really have any more questions in the chat box there, and uh, you know, we're down a few more people now, so let's take us time now to thank Chad once again. Uh, really appreciative of your time to uh, present for our group here, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of this will get a lot more views as well once it's posted out there too. So thank you very much. Yeah, my privilege. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming on to the line and staying with us this whole time. Say goodbye if you want. <laughs> now, now a bunch of my classmates actually, because I, I graduated in the mid eighties and there's no work. And they went off and they, they went into insurance or sales. Stop.